people welcome welcome this welcome. is two girls one ghost two girls one ghost and we are your ghostesses that is corinne and i am sabrina oh and i meant i have my lighter i want to start the show off by lighting my candles Ooh, good call i have two i should light behind me i'm gonna save mine for for october i only have a probably okay. enough in my stash for october but you should do yours i have mine going right here the little one i love it <gasps> And oh, oh stuck my finger in it. Do you see my newest addition to our setup? Oh, the Book of the Dead. The <laughs> Wait, Book look. of the Dead. I also have the gift you gave me as part of my setup. People that were joining us on Patreon, on our Patreon live last night, yeah. saw us unwrap the gifts we got each other for <gasps> our, our birthdays. They I also saw you. me wearing this same outfit that <laughs> same I wore outfit. yesterday. <laughs> Whatever. Because I haven't changed. That's okay. But I got you yeah. the Book of the Dead, the New York Times uh -huh. Book of the Dead. It's just a compilation of a ton of obituaries. Yes. So you might regurgitate some of the interesting information you hear from mm -hmm. us. And then Sabrina found an Etsy shop that had this ectoplasm. And it's from the like the Salem 1800s, Society right? of Spiritual Research. Yes, yeah, so it's from 1891. I think it's decor. Okay, well, let's just pretend it's real. Okay. Well, I'm I'm hoping it's decor because <laughs> I'm scared otherwise. <laughs> but it's so cool. It comes in a box like this. And oh, oh. And then it says ectoplasm. ectoplasm. And it's like this little, it's uh you can see up close. Mm, that's a ghost soul in there. It's a soul. It's the spirit of a ghost. So I'll just cl yeah. noisily close this. Our editors are going to be like, why did you open a wooden crate? <laughs> so sorry. Go. Sorry. Because it's beautiful and we had to show everyone. I know. How exciting. Yeah. I have to figure so out. Exciting. I need to put this on display in a better way. I need to figure out what my exact background is going to be for. I know. And, and then, then we have to months. redo our frames so that we have spooky things happening. I know I actually – well, some of them I can't redo because they're like full – like they're whatever, oh. fully done. Yeah. But I did up here uh, – there's poison hemlock. So I thought Ooh. that was spooky enough. And yeah, then actually right that. here, you're going to be surprised. So I, I started figuring out some of it. Right here I have um, cats. Cats in an <gasps> alleyway. You have cats? The, yeah. Oh, is it all the black cats? It's all the black cats, and then you mm -hmm. can't see the one up here, but it's this guy who I can't remember, but he's some famous guy, um, and he's dancing with a skeleton. So I'll just have to take oh. pictures of it for everybody else to see. I love it. Okay. I have to figure out because I think I'm in a similar situation where some of these I can't change, but – And some of them I, I feel like already go. You yeah, know? my Bill Murray and the ones right in front of the candle go, but – and then I can't change this one. Right. But I think it's I just like little pockets rest. of Halloween. And you can't see you, know? you can't see the one right now, but the one from our wedding, it's my dream photo because it looks like the picture from The Shining. Ooh. Should Ooh. I verge up real quick so everyone can see? Yeah. Oh. That one at the top. <laughs> I love it. It's so fun. Yeah. Are those black candles that you have in your background too? They are dark green. But dark green. They, Ooh. Yeah. Moody. We'll pretend they're black. Uh, green. The elevator in my apartment complex tells you fun facts and it was just saying how colors influence your feelings and green gives mm. you peace and all of this stuff. So now I'm like, I need to turn everything green because the elevator you do told have me a to. Lot of plants. Your plants instill peace, I think, in you. You have so many. You do. You do. I did kill do. one. That's I'm okay. Just I killed my him basil. There. I had like this planter box I was so excited about. And I planted like, you know, I planted the pre, you know, the things that you buy at the grocery store, like the basil plants that have like the mm -hmm. roots and stuff, and then a mint plant. And they were doing so well. And then we went away for two weeks and came back. And now they're just like withering away, little like decrepit souls reaching out of the, the garden, and being like, you killed me. You killed me. Um, Basil's and then hard I put, though because you're supposed to water it like every freaking day. You can't. I know. It's too tough. But then I had these little seeds of a lettuce. Like I had lettuce, kale, romaine, a bunch of different things. And I planted them and they were budding. They, like they sprouted little 
like beautiful no tiny way. baby but then i think but then you went away them no Wait, but who? before i went like, away i think little creatures critters mm. animals cryptids i don't know someone came little and ate cryptids. them and i was like well at least someone ate this food um i have to Not tell me. you so we're starting to ish look for a house so the mm-hmm. search starts but if anyone's purchased a home in Massachusetts or in the Boston area, they'll know or that the search, uh, yeah, or if like city city people too, um, the search once you start could take two to three years. So it's uh, it's not like I'm going to have a house tomorrow. But <laughs> there was this house that our realtor had suggested that we go to. It wasn't in a town that we had originally been looking at, but it was a really good price. Uh, and it was huge. It was like 5,000 plus square feet. And we were like, holy moly. Like, it was unreal that this was within our price range. And, yeah. and she was like, let's just go look at it. Like, you know, that this wasn't where you guys were originally looking, which surprise, uh-huh. surprise, we're looking around Salem. Mm, <laughs> My I would favorite. Die. I yeah, would but, love if you lived in Salem. Oh, I know, right? I know part of me was like, oh, I want, I want to like have a house right there before you move. Fulfill all your or witchy before dreams. You move before you come and visit so that we can just putz around Salem nonstop. Ugh, um, so but fun. anyway, we go into this house. It's beautiful. It's yeah. huge. So of course you'd expect to be like really dazzled and be like, oh my gosh, like, you know, see all the possibilities, all the parties you could throw. Me and my fiance Brian and our realtor all walk out of the house and go, that was really weird, wasn't it? <gasps> There was something with the energy and all of us felt it. We, and we all were just like, no, no, nope. heebie jeebies. Nope, nope, nope. And it was, oh it, I mean, it was our, it was our chance for a mansion. And we all walked out and but we're like, that's a, there's that there's a reason happen. that it was so affordable, I guess. Yeah, I know. I don't know. It was, there's something off. But now I'm like, now I wow. get to do the things that we always talked about where it's like, when you enter a space what do you feel? Is it going to be good? Is it going to be bad? Yeah. And now we've we felt a lot of nothing. We felt one that was really warm. And now this is our first one. We were like, nope. Bad vibes. Bad vibes. Bad vibes. Yikes. It does make you wonder what's going on in there. Do the, this do is the why... people who own it feel that way too? Or are mm. they creating the bad energy? Ooh. See, this is why you can't buy a house sight unseen because – it's all about the vibes. You need yeah, you to know. To feel. You got to feel it. Feel it Because out. otherwise, I think anyone would want to buy this house. I think someone did. Yeah. They didn't feel the vibes, I guess. Or they ignored it. They were like, eh. Gotta feel I the get vibes. rid of this. What's that song? Like, feel the vibe. Baby, yeah. are you coming for the ride? I just wow. I'm looking to you. Yep. Yeah. That's how we feel about houses. Um, also. A f- oh, wait. Happy pumpkin spice latte day oh today is the day today is the day day. it's we're recording on august 30th august 30th starbucks has announced all of their fall drinks their Um, fall drinks are are any new ones let's take a look why don't we peruse the menu starbucks is fall anything new for us to try Um, i do love pumpkin spice latte my go-to is I do a black iced coffee with like one pump of the pumpkin latte spice mm-hmm. thing because it, sometimes it's too sugary for me. Yeah, sometimes it okay. is. Okay. Starbucks's pumpkin spice latte returns Tuesday, which is today, August 30th. See what else is on the fall menu. <laughs> okay, what else? Whereas I need like a list. I don't like when it's like I'm curious. this whole thing. So my favorite drink um, is an iced dirty chai. That's what I always order oh, when I go I to Starbucks. dirty chai. And so I wonder, I wonder if the chai syrup and the pumpkin syrup mixed together would be really good, or mm. that's just going to be weird, like too many flavors. No, try it. No, but that's like such chai, a good idea. Yeah, like a chai icing on pumpkin bread. That's a thing. Okay, I'm going to try it. Oh, I'll pumpkin bread back. is so good. Maybe I'll do it tomorrow. Okay, it says the apple crisp macchiato is also back, which mm. was introduced last year. Um, oh, a spiced apple drizzle. That sounds good. That does sound good. Let's see what else. Um, the, what are the pumpkin cream cold brew. Um, it doesn't really look like this is a full menu. So this article lied to me. Is there a cup design? Don't they normally do that where it's like here's the the fun the design? Mm-hmm. I don't know. I feel like it caused drama in the past few years. 
Oh, some of God, the designs. this is making me want this so bad. I know. <laughs> Next time we record, ooh, for Halloween, ooh. we should come with our pumpkin spice lattes. Basic bitches, here we come. Uh, oh, for us? Yeah. Oh, to... I'm sorry. I thought you meant there was something on the menu that we're going to really love because we're basic bitches. But you're saying that because it's our basic bitch holiday, which (laughs) we'll own it and we freaking love it. And I don't think there's anything basic about it. No, there's not. But if that's the definition of basic, then I want to be president. I'm a basic booch and come at me. You're wearing very pumpkin spice colors. I am. And we're Halloween-y today. You're black. I'm orange. (gasps) We are. We, Wait, we were are. like this lo- yesterday too. Yeah, this is why I didn't change. <laughs> I worked out between and I showered, but I put it back on because it's so comfortable. Actually, Corinne gave this to me. It's a nightgown, but it doubles as like a nice, fancy, looks like professional shirt. It does. It yeah. does look nice. I want one for myself. Thank you. I'm drinking out of my fantasy football mug. Um, <gasps> Tis the season. Tis the season. I'm just Corinne, remembering did you win the last time. year. It was two years ago. I didn't play last year because we didn't have one at the place that I was working at. But uh, when I was working two jobs, two companies ago, Mm -hmm. I, much to the dismay of all of the male members of the office and a few of the female members of the office that were very into football and knew what they were doing, um, I won. (laughs) Corinne won. Hell yeah. Yeah. I was actually telling my uncle the other day that I... I won that. It's like one of my proudest accomplishments. And he I didn't believe me that I picked my team by looking at pictures of them and pretending to be their mom and which one I felt the most joy like emanating from as their mother. I would argue that that method takes a lot more energy and time commitment than the like looking at their stats. It's a, It was like a little Reiki moment, you know, like you put your yeah, hand over, you, you see the where the energy's buzzing and you're like, got it. So does this and episode look, feel the vibe? Or it paid off. A vibe, whatever it's I called, the song? Kind of vibe. Uh, yeah. So now I have a mug yeah. and I think I won like $100 or something. It was pretty sweet. Yeah. So we're basic bitches who also win fantasy football. Although I, I did the same thing as you my first few years. I won three years in a row. <laughs> Super nice. And then ever since then, I've been like last place. I, so I don't know what happened. Did you play against Nick? Yeah. Oh, that must have pissed him off. <laughs> Nick was mad that I was winning fantasy football and we weren't even yeah. in this, we're not even <laughs> in the same league I and know. he was like I can't believe you're, you're about to win your he's fantasy football he's just jealous because he wants to win actually more than anything he wants the Vikings to win the Super Bowl mm. and if they do we will attend because it's yeah. a lifelong dream of his oh when did what? Mm, never mind I'm gonna ask dumb questions about sports and I can and just and I will not have the answer Right. I I realized you wouldn't. So I was like, why am I going to ask this? Why don't I just Google it later? We could we could uh, consult a friend in a bit. We can pull Nick in. Phone a friend? To phone a friend. You know, oh he gosh, would love I, to be on the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> What's up? What's up? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, it's time. Should we do it's spooky time. stories? Yes. Okay. I'll be honest here. E! I was nervous. I woke up with anxiety at 6 a.m. because for some reason in this new format where one of us does the majority of the research, Mm -hmm. I just feel pressure. Like I feel nervous. Yeah. I mean, that's what I felt last week. Welcome to my life. Yeah. I'm like, if I screw up, this is, this is like solely on me. We all know that I won't screw up up this episode. (laughs) You will not screw up. Not only have we been doing this for five years, Corinne, it's the same thing. It's just I'm not going afterwards. Yeah. Okay. And I'm here to back you up. And so is Leia. She's even here. Did you hear a little like chirps? She's here to support you. Mm-hmm. I am so excited for this. We have been putting off talking about this. But- yeah. We've been sitting on our hands for five years hey. because this topic felt so big. Yeah. And previously we were like, how would how how could we and how would we tackle this? Uh, and this so is how. This is how. We are going to talk the lost colony of Roanoke. Yes, and this we are. Is a two parter. <gasps> what? Our first two parter. Woo party. 
So we'll see if everyone's like, Corinne's not allowed to do episodes by herself and Corinne's not allowed to do two parts after this. But hopefully you won't feel that way. Yes, you are. No, it's going to be amazing. I can't wait. So researched. How historic. (laughs) It's going to be great. And there's also a lot of um, players that come into play in the Roanoke story. Mm -hmm. So I've gone ahead and prepared a quick take on each person you bring up. Oh, okay. All right. Well, okay. we'll see how how well not each because I don't know. Yeah, I don't know I'm like you didn't see my up, research. But, There's a lot of people in here. But I did listen to like quite a few podcasts about Roanoke and in preparation. Um, I yeah, you can fill some, in the gaps anywhere I missed. Yeah, and I formed some judgments on the people involved in this story. And great, I'm kind of gonna do it like my like what I would write in their yearbook. I love this. A little <laughs> like a superlative or what their bio would be. What their um, senior like, quote is. Uh, oh, we could do senior quotes. I'll come up with quotes for them at, on the fly. Um, okay. I more was like if I would write in their yearbook or not, you know? You know what came up the other day when I was, again, at a wedding because every weekend I'm at a wedding, but there were a bunch of people from high school and someone was like, this is cringe. She sees dead people. And I was like, why <laughs> did I not put that as my senior quote? Oh, I'm my pissed. gosh. If I could go back 15 years, that would be it. I think but I put alas. like a Kesha quote. <laughs> that that doesn't, does not surprise me at all. Okay. In 1587. Okay. Around 115 men, women, and children were left on the Roanoke Island. When help returned three years later, they found the group to have disappeared. The only clue, a cryptic word carved into a tree. Croatoan. Croatoan. is the mystery of Roanoke, the lost ah. colony. A mystery that has baffled researchers, archaeologists, and explorers for years. And as historian Adrian Masters puts it, Roanoke is the Area 51 of colonial history. Which is yes. why we love it. We love it. It actually gives me – what's the colony you spoke about or like the group of people we, you spoke about? Oh, God, it was so long ago. That truly just disappeared. Was Machu like Picchu? Canada, maybe? I have no was idea. It? Okay, <laughs> I'll have to think of it. I'm pretty sure you did an episode. I'm, no, I'm positive you did an episode on it. And like, I don't know. Or maybe I'm like combining things. There's also like the group of people on the ship that froze. The people that froze. Yeah, what was that? Like the USS Nimitz or something? That's probably something, totally wrong. Yeah. Um, and then th- there was the, well, I guess that's different. The people that were, why am I forgetting the name? The avalanche that wiped out all of those people, but in a really oh, bizarre way. Dyatlov? Yes, Dyatlov Pass. I don't know. There's just, I mean, maybe I did cover something where everybody There was something. But I can't quite remember. Yeah. Might have anyway. been. Anyway, this one, this one is... What we know of it is still baffling everybody to this day, but there are some new clues and there are some <laughs> there. Whoa, <laughs> there is some new evidence coming into play here. So to understand how this could happen, we need a little bit of backstory on the time period and the players and the growing tensions and the relationships with the native people of North America. So let's dive into the history and mystery. And I'll say now... Ooh, the history and the mystery. The history and the mystery. I'll say now that uh, there are a lot of people, so I'm going to try my best to make this not confusing for everybody. And there are also a lot of Native American tribes and people's names. And I did a lot of research into how to pronounce these names. And sometimes uh, there was no information on it. So I'm going to try my best. Uh, But there's... There's a good opportunity here or a, a pretty good chance that I'll screw up. So if you know how to pronounce it, let us know. Comment on Instagram yeah. or put this in the, the comments of YouTube so that we can learn. Yell at us. <laughs> Give us one star As and people say, so often do. <laughs> say, I don't believe in ghosts. Grow up. <laughs> yeah. I sent this to Corinne recently. There was a one star review. It said the subject was grow up paranormal is not real was the body of it and it's like okay then don't listen to a <laughs> paranormal you podcast you ding dong you ding dong oh okay all right so the lost colony 
the lost colony of Roanoke, this is in the time that Queen Elizabeth was in reign over England and Ireland, which is a bit of a quick callback to episode 160 because, Sabrina, you covered her mother, Anne Boleyn. Uh, mm-hmm. So there's a lot of mysteries and a lot of ghosts within British royal history. So Queen Elizabeth, at the time, she's dealing with a lot. She has to wade through all of this political drama. She's trying to avoid war. She's trying not to clash with other nations. And she's having a go at many husbands and relations and relatives <laughs> to uh, try to produce her heir. She did, I think, a cousin impregnated her eventually. So, you know. Having her go at husbands. Having her go yeah. at husbands. Uh, and then she's also partially responsible for sending her cousin turned eventual baby daddy's mom, Mary Queen of Scots, to prison. So she's just, there's a lot going on. Her she's busy. pretty busy. Yeah, she's she's causing some drama and also trying to steer away from some of it. So she's all over the place. Uh, there's but a lot of pressure life, on her too. Totally. And the life does sound pretty exhausting, which I can under understand why so she gathers up a bunch of other men and is like you know what despite everything that's going on let's be competitive out here all these other people are going to explore they're sailing to the west to these new lands you Mm -hmm. need to also go and see what we can do and set up colonies and so Mm -hmm. queen lizzie became a colonizer (laughs) and she sent men to america to do this She hires Sir Walter Raleigh to pick up where his late brother left off, and he sails, well, he doesn't sail, but he is tasked with creating the very first English colony in North America. And he has no real direction in terms of where he needed to go. He could pretty much go wherever he wants. She's like, do whatever you want, bring back gold, and give me one-fifth of it, which is a really good deal. Resources. Yeah. But also one-fifth. If I were the queen, I'd be like, you owe me 95%. Yeah, that is interesting. Well, I mean, she's already the queen. She has a lot of money. I guess she doesn't need it all. I guess. I don't know. I feel like the power would really go to my head. Okay, I'm pretty sure Walter Raleigh is the first person I have a superlative for. Or not a superlative. I've heard he's a jerk. And he might be like... Most people in this story are. (laughs) Yeah, but I heard he... There's like two people specifically in this story that are like really big jerks. And it's Walter and then someone else who will come up later. And... Mm -hmm. I know exactly who um, you're talking about. I think I'm going to put like devil horns on his photo in my yearbook. Okay. I love that. That's a perfect illustration. Okay. Yeah. There's some things and there's some things about him that will come up in part two of this as well. So if we don't get all the devil horn uh, evidence and and facts coming forth, it will be a part of part two. But devil horns on Raleigh. So he can go wherever he want. He just has to give a fifth of his his gold treasure to the queen. But he's yeah. actually not allowed to leave England. So instead, he has to hire different people, different men and, and groups of people to go over. And he orchestrates from across the pond, sending these people to go colonize on his path. So in 1584, Raleigh sends Philip Amatus and Arthur Barlow to America. They get to the Roanoke area. And we now know Roanoke Island area to be in Dare County, North Carolina. But at the time, it seemed to these English folk that this was unsettled land, though it was not because it was populated by many, many Native people and different Native American tribes. I mean, this is the story with every colony, like any colonization, especially of the Americas or like Mm -hmm. we pretend like we were the first people here, the first settlers. And it's like, well, no, we stole and robbed land. Exactly. I mean, yeah, the yeah. native people of this land would suffer because of these conquests yes, greatly. very, very greatly. And like as we syphilis know in America, and all types of dr- uh, diseases and everything. Totally. And then also just being take their resources just being taken from them. Yeah. And that's never been corrected. I mean, people yeah. are still very much suffering in America from these groups today. And a lot of these groups never, they, they were, they didn't survive the right. past four uh, decade or oh my gosh centuries the past four centuries yeah. like there's a lot of groups that were players at this time that don't exist anymore which is upsetting very sad yeah they meet the Secatan, the native people who controlled the area and apparently this group of colonists they vibe with the Secotans. so they get along they establish good relations which i'm like how much truth is there to that but apparently mm-hmm. 
they got along. And Amanis and Barlow are like, wow, these people are really kind. They're super hospitable. I think there's room for us here. And so they leave in- for England again, and they bring with them two native people, Wenchis, who is Secatan, and Monteo, who is Croatan, and whose mother was chieftain of Croatoan Island. So they're now in England, this group of explorers, these Englishmen, colonists, colonizers, uh, and these two people from who are representatives of two of the native tribes of the area. They go back to England and they tell Queen Elizabeth that this is a great spot. And Raleigh, who's orchestrating all of these, that this is a great mm-hmm. spot to send a full colony of people. The land is bountiful. It is the Garden of Eden. And so this man named Ralph Lane, who I think is the other asshole. Yes. Probably he, on your he's list. He's a jerk. Okay. So there's three jerks in this story. Okay. There's three jerks. Okay. So Ralph Lane is next for Raleigh to send to Roanoke Island with a few other people, including Monteo and Winchis. So they get sent back to their own native land. So that was one of the big questions where I was like, "Uh Oh, what happened to these people that are just brought over to England? They apparently were returned and were a big part of helping the colonists integrate in or attempt to integrate in with the native people of the land. And that's so, like the kind of the most incredible part of this story is that the native peoples were so giving and helpful to the colonizers. The, in the only beginning. reason any white person survived as long as they did was because they were getting because aid of the and assistance. Yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a tough, tough subject. Yeah, yeah. So they head for Roanoke Island because this is going to be the best spot for them to have access to the ocean, but also avoid detection from Spanish patrols. There was a lot of privateering, which is basically pirating, happening at the time. And there was a lot of colonization from from other countries, too. And so, you know, if the Spanish had, had seen them, they likely would have been attacked So they wanted to be in the best spot for them to have visibility and also to be a bit hidden and to have a quick getaway. And Roanoke Island, they thought, was the perfect space for all of this. So they set up shop. They build the Roanoke Fort. The colony quickly constructs buildings like a church, a jail, etc. But there is a problem. Once they're there, Lane, who is not a nice guy, his relationship with the native people is trash. And they're running out of supplies. There are many mm-hmm. tribes in this area, so you'll hear me name a few, like the Croatan, the Secatan, and the Aquascagak. Aquascagak. I hope I said that name that name correctly. Um, but Lane doesn't get along with pretty much any of them. He's mostly Lane. murdering them. So, Lane, get get the God, fuck just... out, Lane. Get, get yeah. out. Get out. Well, he's dead now, so. <laughs> uh, okay well he might have been is... reincarnated and i'm still get out i know get out an example of his cruelty is that after misplacing a silver cup lane's people blamed it on the aquascogic people demanding that they cough up the stolen goods and the people there were like uh we don't have your cup we never took your cup so lane's crew burned the entire town down and its crops forcing the native people to flee so His reputation precedes him, and the Native people anticipate Lane and his colonies as they arrive and kind of venture out and explore different areas out from the Roanoke Island uh, home base, which bites him in the butt because he's pretty dependent on the Native people for help securing food for his colony. They don't know what they're doing. And so they start working again, kind of back and forth to restore this relationship with the native people. And with some persuading, Wanchis and Mateo, the Secatan, and the neighboring villages did give some food. They provided venison, fish, oysters to help these people get through winter, which is incredibly kind, especially yeah. because they are being slaughtered and their homes yeah. are being burned to the ground. And it wasn't this group like 14 men or something like that. Like it's... It, or not 14, maybe a little bit more, but it's mostly men in this group. Oh, it's a very small, it's a small yeah. group. Yeah, Just I think there's men. 15, 15 soldiers total. It's like very military. Yeah. So they're they, they totally. not going with this like mindset of harmony. They're going with this mindset of domination 
exactly. military. So they are, yeah, they, they're already going in with bad intentions. Right. And a lot of the areas where Native people, a lot of the Native groups that were set up were were smaller groups of people. There were, of course, larger groups and a lot of, mm-hmm. uh, you know, like they had their own different tie-ins and, and relations when it came to power and who who was like the chief of who. But for the most part, a lot of the groups that they were, that these men, these European men were coming across were smaller groups of families. Yes. You know, it was very harmonious before they came. And then unfortunately, yeah. um, pretty much a, another component as to why these people were giving them venison and shellfish and all of this stuff was because Lane would kidnap the people and hold them ransom in exchange for food. So altogether not great. The colony, they were growing corn and they were quickly working through all of the food and supplies that they had brought on the ship. And the natives, the native tribes are now like, screw these people. They keep killing us. They keep kidnapping us. And now they're giving all all of these diseases to us. We're dying of smallpox, of measles, you know, there's syphilis, like there's a lot that's happening. And so they're like, we're done. No more help. And they literally retreat. Like when the men are going down the riverbanks and whatnot, like they'll, the native people will run away. So it's becoming a lot more difficult for Lane and his men because everybody knows what's to come if they encounter them to get any, any food. Right. So- Without assistance from the native tribes, the colonists would surely die. So Lane's trying to make peace again, and lucky for him, an opportunity arises because there's a power shift amongst some native tribe leaders. Secatan leader, Grand Ganimio, who was a powerful advocate for the colony despite his people's reluctance to help Lane and the people, he passes away. So when Gina took power and changed his name to Pemisipan, which is which means the one who watches. And Pemisipan did not like how overtly reliant everyone was on them. And he was pretty suspicious of Lane's group, which makes mm. total sense. Yeah, fair. So it's super fair. There's, there's no, no like subtle, that. there's no subtlety. There's no subtle sub- suspicion there. It's like very outright right. totally. violent Lane jerk scribbled out in my yearbook. Yep. Devil horns and the tail coming up. Just yeah, I like I probably started eyes. with that, but then I like you know I took a black sharpie and just like scribbled out his whole face because yes, I was like I don't even want to know him. Yeah. He has a spot in the burn book for sure. Yep. Mm-hmm. So Pumice fans like mm, I'm gonna push these people a little bit. I'm going to see how much they can really be trusted, and I'm gonna see how much I can do to give us the upper hand here. So Lane is none the wiser. He's just stupid butt face and he has no <laughs> idea what's going on. So Pemis Pan and Lane are talking. Lane thinks that they're buds, they're communing, they're, you know, scheming together, figuring out ways to colonize and, f- and where to go next. Mm-hmm. And so Lane is explaining to Pemis Pan his exploration plan beyond the Secretan territory. He wants to explore more of the land. He wants to get more food. Maybe he's going to move this entire colony, which is really just, like you said, a small group of soldiers. And Pemispan's like, cool, cool, cool. But did you know that everybody is planning on attacking you? I met with my allies and Chief Minotonin told me that there are 3,000 warriors gathering to attack you in your colony. And Lane is like, oh my gosh, I did not know this. Thank you for telling me. What could have caused this? Wow. Oh, what a surprise. So wow. okay, Lane- Owen Wilson over there. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. It did sound oh, like that. Wow. Oh wow. <laughs> yeah, I think Owen Wilson's a whole lot better of a guy than Lane is. So yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry to Owen, Sir Owen. Uh but Lane is Sir. like, yikes. Let's uh gather the people. Let's get ready for a fight. I'm gonna grab my soldiers. We've got, you know, weapons that can uh do some do some damage. And let's head head to this battle site. But to his surprise, it's just a gathering of representatives from each tribe who are there peacefully. There are no thousands of warriors ready to attack. They're there peacefully, not anticipating or planning an attack of their own, but because they thought Lane wanted to meet to talk about relations and their counsel had been requested. So they gathered trustingly together right and we're sitting ducks essentially what happened was pemisipan 
Remember, he wants to he wants to get the upper hand and he wants to make Lane look even more stupid and dangerous than he already is. So okay. Kamisavan, what he did was he went to Lane and said, hey, everybody's going to attack you. And oh, so Lane so got all ready for a fight. But he also went to Menatonin, another leader, and said, your council and everybody else's is requested. Can you gather everybody? So everybody trusting Menatonin and Lane trusting Pemispan and Menatonin trusting Pemispan came together. And uh, oh, no. yeah, I mean, as we can guess, Lane was really hyped up and aggressive still. His ego didn't immediately go down to, to match everybody right. else's affect. Uh, and he was ready for attack. And so he pretty much did. He kidnapped Menatonin. But Menatonin gains Lane's trust, tells him what he wants to hear, says you'll find copper, you'll find riches, waterways here and there. And so he saves, gets saved. Like he he doesn't get murdered, thank God. Um, okay. But Pemis Pan's still trying to do everything that he can to get Lane kicked out of the popular kids table if this is our <laughs> high school reputations here. So Pemis Pan's plan worked obviously lane looks even crazier than he did before and nobody trusts them or wants to help them mm -hmm. it's been so back and forth with them getting help them not getting help them getting help them not getting help uh but the villagers this time cold turkey no help no food we're not talking to you we will attack you you're on your own yeah you're on your own and so lane is like mm, i don't think this is fun anymore i'm gonna go home <laughs> <laughs> little temper tantrum. Little temper tantrum. And so Pemispan is like, okay, great. But also, how are you even alive still? <laughs> like, this is incredible yeah. that you've even lived this long. So Lane tells his people to break up into smaller, more non-threatening groups uh, and to beg for food in the outer banks and the mainland. Uh, they actually shoot Pemispan and put his severed head on a stake outside of the colony. And then Lane leaves for England. What the heck? Yeah. Till unfortunately as old as time when it comes to what happened to yeah, America. All of this. Yeah. A couple years later in 1857, John White is next up to lead the expedition to this area. E John White's my favorite. I like him. He's okay, the only he's guy kind in of, this story. He's a decent guy. Yeah. He's the only one that would be like, okay, I want to be in a couple clubs with him and like, you yes. know, I'll I'll ask John to sign my yearbook. He also he wasn't he on the expedition with Lane, but he was just like the map. He was. The, he was the artist. Like he wasn't he was. the military guy. He was there to map out and draw. He's an artist. He like exactly. was the one. He's super talented. Detailing places. So there's not, yeah. there's not a ton known about, about John White's past and who he was, but, yeah. but we do know that he was a very talented artist yes. and he is actually responsible for a lot of the early maps that we have of America, at least from yeah. Englishmen. Um, yes. So yeah, he was on that initial journey first, which is even more, yeah. more surprising that he turned out to be a decent, a good person. Decent -ish guy. I mean, of course he like stumbles. He, you know, there's, there's not perfect. Yeah. Still tension and and deaths that happen. What I, um, but in comparison to what he saw Lane do when he was on that trip, he's <laughs> yes. doing really, so really well. I heard in the rumor mill that John White was kind of the reason in the beginning, the native tribes were so giving, I think, but I heard down, you know, the line, um, that he spent a lot of time with the natives and was actually drawing and painting a lot of them and he was trying to oh, learn their language i love and that and he was really vital in having communications with one another whereas like lane was just like yeah. screw everyone i'm gonna bl go through with a bla blazing fire john right. white was like i'm gonna take time to try to understand their languages and and how he was them assimilating he wasn't bulldozing yes. yeah, yeah exactly yeah that's really nice i mean that good guy you know he's not I'm curious who the other asshole is that you have on on your list. That you I'll get hate. to it. I think it's actually during this next journey. So he, because then John White, the reason he gets to lead the next expedition is because he was so jazzed about the previous one. Like he was like, there's so much potential. And he had like a positive outlook about it. And Raleigh is like, great. You're a great person to send yeah, please. over to the Americas. Yes. Um, yeah. So Raleigh has John take 100 people with him, including John's own pregnant daughter, and they set sail for Roanoke. And all of the men who are the head of households, uh, one of the things that's, uh, I guess, 
a reason to go is that you are promised 500 acres of land if you're a male head of household, mm -hmm. which is so huge. I mean, if you're yeah. if you're being told like this is the Garden of Eden, there's so many opportunities here. Like everybody is going to help you, and you're going to be like so set up for for the future. Wouldn't you volunteer to go, whether you're a soldier or not? It, I mean, that sounds awesome. And clearly, right. John John felt good about it because he brought his own pregnant daughter with him as well. Yeah. Though he did leave his the wife whole family. in England. Yeah. Minus his wife. Yeah. Right. So his daughter and his son-in-law are also included. Um, and they're told of treasures of land and gold and all the possibilities. So they're all pretty yeah. stoked. Raleigh Which is interesting because I don't think up until this point, they didn't bring any gold back, right? Like I think the only resource no. was like sassafras. Totally. And John yeah. was... John was on that first expedition. Like, right. he knows it's so he not knows. the Garden of Eden. No. Yeah. <laughs> it's not going to be that violence. easy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's, I mean, it's interesting, but I think that there's a lot of, from the time, a, it's hard to trust. And this is part of the reason that Roanoke is such a mystery, because a lot of what is written in people's journals and in uh, their accounts of, of their encounters with land and Native people and what they're seeing a lot you have to take it at face value because there yeah. was a lot of embellishments a lot of people were straight up lying to be able to get access and funds to have ships where they could literally just go pirate and pillage yeah so a lot of it i mean historians are definitely working to try to decipher what is accurate and what was a fib yeah and there's also not a ton of great record keeping like john no. White wrote like he wrote a journal entry on like the very first day of the expedition and then didn't write another one and for like seven days or was, something. Yeah, like that. So, it was a long time. Yeah. In between. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Raleigh also sign sends Simon Fernandez. Is this the other? This is the other jerk. <laughs> yeah. This is Fernandez. Jerk alert. Really big jerk. Jerk alert. Jerk, jerk, uh, jerk. Fernandez is sent on this boat too because he's an expert navigator and he's there to assist John White. An expert an, jerk is more like it. An expert jerk. <laughs> uh, and probably the reason that John spent so much time uh, in between journaling and not journaling is because yeah. he uh, was kind of fighting but also kind of not with Fernandez. John was kind of a – he was kind of a doormat. Pushover, and, yeah. Yeah. And Fernandez I get was pretty it. aggressive. I relate to John. I get it, John. <laughs> it's hard to be assertive. I'm trying. He didn't want conflict. Uh, <laughs> but unfortunately, because he wasn't – he wasn't – Yeah. Assertive. Assertive and doing what he needed to as the person leading this expedition, it ended up uh, with a lost colony of Roanoke. So we'll get into some of these details. Yes. So Fernandez – is an expert navigator, but does not respect John at all and does not listen to him. Fernandez screws up a few times, costing them a lot of supplies and time. And eventually, after like an extra week of sailing beyond what they were supposed to do, yeah. they get to Roanoke Island. They're only supposed to be here and stop at Roanoke Island for some time, for a very quick amount of time, because they're looking yeah. for English soldiers that were left there to see how they're doing and to check on them. And then the whole crew, the 100 plus people uh, on John's boat are supposed to continue on to Chesapeake Bay. So yes, they get to Roanoke Island and John and the colony get to land and they find abandoned homes. They find a half buried skeleton of one of the soldiers. And this discovery is super unsettling because this dark barren island has clearly been attacked and there's a soldier that wasn't given a proper burial, which means it, it's either... It's an indication that the soldiers, the, the other soldiers buried him in haste right. or that someone else buried this soldier. I also pictured it because it's so apparently like the they got there and it was late at night and the first thing they see is this like half buried soldier. I'm imagining that like the other soldiers didn't even bury him. It was just like he's kind of half skeleton like yeah, he's like, meaning, decomposed. like over time the yeah, the like sand has like washed up onto him and he's totally based on tides. And they apparently had to spend the night there on the sandy beaches before embarking into the forts because they were like, it's too late. It's too dark. This is suspicious. The The soldiers usually come and meet us when we when they see our ships approaching, but they're not here. So it's mysterious. What's happening? Uh, it, and also, Fernandez no bueno. abandoned them. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> to add to the troubles. Yeah. 
The yeah. reason they couldn't just get back on the boat <laughs> was because Fernandez was like, peace out, Girl Scouts. See you. He yeah, no the supplies. Whole, the whole time Fernandez was like, I just am trying to get these people off my boat and I don't even care about their supplies or them because he, it was just another excuse for him to do the privateering, for him to go pirate. He's awful. Yeah. So he was like, yeah, he, he abandoned them. They were stuck on Roanoke Island where they're not supposed to be with a dead Jack skeleton of the person who came before them. Yeah. So, yeah, it's uh, it's not great. Fernandez is like, I'm leaving you. And John White, I wrote, he, John White says, okay, I guess, <laughs> because he was such a pushover. And then John White angrily journals about this conflict in his diary. So he doesn't actually say anything doesn't to Fernandez. doesn't say anything. Yeah. He says nothing. And then he's like... Fernandez is so mean to me today. <laughs> I'm really hurt, but I'm not going to say anything because I don't want to create conflict. It's fine. We're just stranded it's here. Fine. 115 of us, my just pregnant daughter <laughs> with this right? a half buried skeleton soldier. And oh, it's okay. The fact that everyone has disappeared mysteriously from this island for the first time, that won't happen again. Yes. Yes. I mean, every reason for him to be dramatically journaling I just picture the facial expressions he's doing while he's doing it too. It's kind of like... Like really like furiously yeah. his wrist hurts afterwards, his cramps. Do you yeah. do this when you write for podcast episodes? Because I notice I do it too. And then I get embarrassed when Brian will walk in the room because I'll be like... <laughs> like, <laughs> like the facial expressions I you make You get into like so character. Intense. You're feeling it. Yeah. Yeah. I do I that. Really I also when it. I'm writing action sequences or anything, I feel like I act them out and I'm like... And then he kicks and I like get into yes. my physical form. Yeah. Yes. I noticed yesterday that I was doing that in the bathroom. I, I realized once my <laughs> reflection made like an aggressive, my thought, I was reacting to a thought I had. I wasn't even writing, but I was just like picturing, I don't even remember what I was doing, but suddenly I was like, my arm was in the air and I was like, <laughs> what am I doing? I need to control my body right now. Like thoughts can stay inside. They don't have to be everywhere. <laughs> Oh, I love the brain. Dramatic. The fact that like you just were in like some like weird subconscious trance that like your your brain signaled your arm to do that. I was. I was fully. And it wasn't even a conscious out. thought. Yeah. No. And then I was like, oh, good thing the door is closed and no one's in here because this is weird yeah. behavior from me. <laughs> okay. So the group reluctantly sets up camp because they are abandoned. They have uh, no other they option. struggle because again, this area is not the Garden of Eden that they had been promised and these people don't really know how to survive on this land they don't have a ton of supplies left because fernandez is dumb and took way too long to get there and lost half their stuff at sea and also lane's previous expedition didn't quite help with maintaining good relations with the native no. people so there wasn't immense help there either at first and there was still a lot for john white to reconstruct in terms of relationships yeah. So soon the colonists of Roanoke and the native people begin to have better relations and they mostly stay in their agreed upon areas of the island and they occasionally help each other out and communicate. But there mm -hmm. is a misunderstanding that leads to an attack that leaves many native people dead. And so once again, this jeopardizes the colonists uh, as people don't, they're reluctant to help them. Um, yeah. John is doing what he can to better this relationship. He's apologizing. He's working with the chiefs and the leaders of the native people. Um, but also John can't help that he is a white guy from England. And so he's still trying to push his Christianity on them. And it's like, we'll yeah. leave you alone. We'll give you all this land. But also, do you want to be Christian? Do and you want to so, come worship our God? Right. It's not super straightforward. There's like many levels into yeah. how people are communicating and what is being pushed on them and what's actually being decided upon yeah. in a respectful uh, and agreed upon way. So yeah. there's not yeah. a ton of uh, good happening <laughs> throughout no. the story, but yeah. John is the closest to it. The closest to good, which is the not saying The closest much. to good. Yeah. <laughs> we have to pick and choose here. Okay. So 10 months after these colonists arrive under John White's leadership to Roanoke Island, the colonists beg John to go back to England and tell Raleigh and the Queen that it is brutal here, that they need a ton of help. They're out of all of their materials and, and their food. Yeah, they and need resources. They need resources. And like all of the ships that had previously come like came a little bit too late or the seeds were there too late and they weren't able to 
to like plant them in time for growing season. So basically it was just like a series of unfortunate events that led them into starvation, similar to Lane's colony as well. Um, Mm -hmm. And they're super unprepared. They need backup. So they're like, please, John, please go back. And John doesn't really want to go, but he agrees. And he gets back to England finally in 1588 and is ready to grab a ton of supplies and is planning to just turn right back around, go back to Roanoke. But there's one big roadblock in his ship's path And that is that the Anglo-Spanish War has broken out. Mm. He is not able to return to Roanoke until 1590, which is three whole years later. And he left his daughter, his son-in-law, and their newborn there when when he left. Like he left everyone, 115 people at least. She's – she's – the his granddaughter is going to be three years old when he returns. Yeah. Yeah. That is so much time. Yeah. Okay. So imagine you're someone in this colony, right? You were promised a shit ton of an- land. You were promised gold and sassafras and all of these amazing things yeah. that will make you all this money and life is going to be easy and life is going to be happy and everybody around you and the native people are going to be harmonious with you and everything's going to go your way. And that is absolutely not what happened. The first thing you see is a, a dead comrade on, on the beach and just everything is red flag screwed up and then your leader yeah. who's in charge of your safety and comfort is like brb i'm gonna go get more supplies BRB. and then <laughs> you wait you leave the chat leaves the chat you're like a few months i can do this there's 100 plus of us a few more months yeah. you're like okay this isn't really that great he should be back soon and the seasons start changing the hurricanes dump rain on you they tossle your encampments the ground gets hard, your crops die, your hopes die, and you might die. So what would you do if you were in that scenario? Run. This, right? Flee. Okay. Yep. And that is uh, one of the theories because this is Ask the question that everybody's – To abduct me. Please. Please. <laughs> please. Okay. August 26, 2023, aliens, please abduct Sabrina. It's her 30th birthday. Please. We need a manifest. Please. <laughs> I will be in Italy. Beep, if you need beep. to know where I am, oh. I'll be in Florence, Italy at a wedding. I'll be ready. Really? You have one mm-hmm. on your birthday next year? Yeah. In Italy? Mm-hmm. You need to stop having friends that have weddings <laughs> in Italy. This is your like third or fourth one, isn't it? Third, yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. Well, Non-stop. It's fun yeah. to go to Europe. It is very fun. Okay, so... This is the age-old question for the mystery of Roanoke is what did these people decide? What would you do if you were in this scenario? And it is a question that's been around for centuries. And it's a question that John White asked for the rest of his life. For when he returned three years later to his colony of 100 plus people, they had vanished. Upon arriving to the coastline, John White and his fleet first anchor at Croatoan Island on August 12th, 1590 in case people forgot what, what year we're in. <laughs> they see some plumes of smoke in the distance at Roanoke Island, and so they're like, ooh, the colony, they're there. So they sail over. However, the weather is super bad. The sea is tossing them all over the place. So they spend two days attempting to cross the Pamlico Sound, which is the largest lagoon in North America's east coast. And people die. Like, this is not easy sailing for them to get Jeez. there it's basically only 50 miles apart but the sea the weather is brutal when they're here and the so, fact that they can see plumes of smoke and they can see yet it. it takes them days to get there it totally does and yeah it's super super bad people are dying but that's what they're supposed to do they're supposed to come back and and basically like find all of the the colonists that they left behind yeah. uh so on august 17th they see fire again on the north end of Roanoke, and they start rowing towards it. So they leave the larger ship, they get in smaller boats, and they row towards the land. But they can't fully make it to shore, so they anchor their smaller boats, and they loudly sing songs, they play a trumpet, hoping that the colonists would hear them and know that the crew had returned with provisions and will anticipate their arrival. Happy arrival, yeah. Yep, here we are, we're coming, it's taking us a while, the sea is sucking right now, but we're coming. So on the morning of August 18th, it's John's granddaughter's third birthday now. Today is her birthday. What a great present, right? So he's going to come to shore. He's going to see his family. He's going to see the colonists. He's going to bring them all the supplies that they so badly needed. Hooray. He's a hero. Everyone's happy. Celebrations. 
John and the men walk onto the shorelines and they see fresh tracks in the sand, but no one comes out to greet them. Surely this Mm -hmm. person would have heard them singing and playing their trumpet, right? Or they would have spotted their boat in the morning, especially if there are fresh tracks. They would have seen them, right? Uh, But no one's there. And so they continue walking up the shoreline and into the tree line. They pass a tree with the letters C-R-O carved into it. Crow. A clue, maybe. They continue on to the colony site, getting to the palisade, which is this fence that the colony had created from trees to sort of fortify their home. And one of the posts at the front of the entrance also had C-R-O carved into it. But this time, the word was completed. Croatoan, it read. A clue. The group must have picked up and moved camp from Roanoke Island to Croatoan Island. So before White left, he had actually talked to the group about what to do if they were in distress. And they agreed that if something happened, if they needed to leave, if there was some sort of distress and they couldn't stay on Roanoke Island, that uh, they would leave this image of a Maltese cross, which if you Google it, which I did, it looks like four arrows basically pointing into each other. Right. Like a four-leaf clover of arrows. So this is not a Maltese cross. But to John, this is still a message telling him where to find this group. So the rescue party is like, all right, this makes sense. But we also did just spend some time anchored off of Croatoan Island, and we didn't really spot any activity there. So that would be strange if 100-plus people were there and we didn't see any signs. Yeah. So the group continues. They're looking around this fort around Roanoke that is totally abandoned for any more clues. And the house like up and vanished abandoned. Like up and vanished. Like the house no one grabbed anything. Cleanly dismantled. Yeah. Like they it was like someone took time to take things away. There really was not much evidence left Mm -hmm. of this encampment. The weapons were left behind though, too. Like it wasn't like, oh, they were were looking for or they were in like distress and they had a fight. Right. And like little bits of pottery and stuff, but like the boats were taken. It was more of just like a, here's, here's where you, your encampment, where you spent a bunch of time yeah. and now you're taking like most of your stuff. It was, it seemed like a gentle move, but also a very quick move with no real evidence as to where you so went. I, I was reading about this and I think it was during John White's, or, or I can't remember. It was one of the times that they got there they had made a plan for like the buildings and everything and it was supposed to be like the big fence around the entire city so like the like houses huts whatever and Mm -hmm. then the market square but apparently when they built it they actually built the fence only around the market square and then the houses were like outside of it which is like a silly thing like that doesn't really protect you and then they were all constructed to very easily come down so you can transport them if you had to move your location. But if these are taken apart but not transported, it's like, well, these were built specifically for that purpose. Yeah. I mean, I think they were taken though. They were, they were taken down and moved. Oh. I think there was a lot that, that uh, had been gone. I mean, there was still like slight evidence that there had been people there. Like for example, um, a few items were left behind that were too large and too heavy or were Mm. no use to them. One of them being John's belongings. <laughs> they left all of his stuff behind. I mean, kind of nice because they're like, he'll come back for this. Yeah. So his trunk Which is were even there. more mysterious because it feels that feels so intentional then. Right? Yeah. But his his trunks were not safe. They were looted. But it does. It's like, mm. okay. To to John, right. He's like seeing that a lot was dismantled, a lot was was brought somewhere. And that somewhere must be Croatoan island because that's all that's written there that's the only clue and how else would it make sense for them to leave his stuff at the spot where he said he'd come back to and then just up and vanish yeah that's it is strange yeah so he's like they must have relocated there's no sign of retreat under duress like you said there's some weapons there like there's no bodies there's no signs of famine or like cannibalism or or anything like that yeah nothing they're just gone they're just gone 
So Croatan is clearly where John and the guys need to go next. So they plan to go investigate the next morning, but their boat's anchor, the main boat that they had, snapped, and they only had one more left. And with the churning seas, it was way too risky for them to stay and risk the boat losing another cable, the last cable, uh, and becoming shipwrecked. So the crew asked John if he wanted to head south to the Caribbean for the winter and then come back next spring and pick up their search for this group. And he said, yes. So that's their plan. But the winds, the sea is wild. The winds end up blowing them so far off course that they end up having to just go back to England. Nothing is in their favor in this situation. Nothing is in their favor. Situation. No. Like nothing's going right. Yeah. Right. Which is which is unfortunate because then there's so much time passing between when these colonists were last seen and when people are actually like on the ground looking for them. Yeah. There's really small concentrated periods of time. Yeah. In really like stretched out duration. Like it, the search was basically over like 100 years initially. And the fact that they left – the fact that John and the crew were not able to come back until for three years. Like think about how uncharted – the territory and land was during this time. So truly like th in three years, like it could have been like John left and three days later they picked up and moved, you know? So like right? that could be two and a half years, t almost three years of, of them moving and relocating. Right. And who's to say how far away they went, right? You know, like exactly. you go somewhere, you make relations with the the native people 50 miles west and they tell you, oh, I think you the crops that you have and the soil you're looking for is actually another 100 miles north. Like they can yeah. keep going. Just keep like, going. Yeah. 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 So you, they really have no idea what's going on. Um, yeah. So there's a few more official search expeditions that take place, the final one being in 1603, but the colonists of Roanoke were never found. They were lost. And so there are a few theories as to what happened to them. And one fact that is up for debate as well is that some people don't think that John White had actually returned or had headed to the Caribbean and then returned to England. Some people mm -hmm. think that he did stay a whole year or, or through the winter looking for the colonist because he was looking for his daughter and his yeah, granddaughter like so it was personal. his family um that's up for debate but regardless of whether he stayed or not there were no extra clues there was nothing right. else found yeah um oh i wrote down this one fun fact and we should definitely say it so Love his his daughter eleanor dare was one of 17 women who came to establish this colony and she gave birth to virginia dare who was the first child of english parents born in north america so Virginia Whoa. is pretty special, um, and hopefully she lived past infancy because the it's conditions. It's one of those things that I am so curious if with technology like 23andMe today, if there's a way to trace their ancestry. Okay, so there is actually a big ancestry tracing project going on for Roanoke. Uh, they haven't found any clues yet. Mm. But they are trying to. They said one of the difficulties is that because it's, it's the ancestors would be from the 1500s. So yeah, by how then, do you get there? Your DNA is so incredibly diluted that some people yeah. might have like no seeable trace of any Whoa. ancestral lineage to the people. So you know, if we had DNA evidence 200 years prior to here, we probably could see and trace it. But right now, right. it's. It's so far removed that it's really difficult. That's fair. But they're trying. There is a project that is taking into consideration DNA evidence as to what happened to these people. Did anyone yeah. from the colony I mean, this live? gives me so much Outlander vibes, which if you haven't heard me talk about Outlander, you guys, you got to watch it. But it is really interesting. Like, could you imagine finding out that you're related to John White and Eleanor and this family? And right tracing back your oh, it's just Virginia so Dare. Yes. Yeah. I know. That would, I mean, that would be incredible if that happened. I hope that there's some sort of evidence that comes out that these people did continue to yeah, live. Yeah, to live. Yeah. Uh, okay. But a popular theory is that the colony assimilated into various tribes utilizing more of the land further inland from Roanoke. Like Kind of like what you said. They picked up camp. They, they continued on and found a place mm -hmm. that would actually uh, assist them in living. So, yeah. so there are or there were a few accounts from both European colonists and native chiefs that suggest that this could be true. 
Captain yeah. John Smith, the one to put depicted in Pocahontas, a movie which we all know has a million and one problems, um, when he stumbled upon a promising clue when he was captured by the Powhatan and met with their chief, Wahunsnaka, which is Poc- or was Pocahontas's father and yeah. Wahunsnaka's brother. So John Smith, when he was captured, they told him of a place called Okanahonan, which I really tried to look up the pronunciation of that and I could not find it anywhere. So hmm. uh, if you know it, please let us know. Um, yeah. But this place, Okanahonan, was where men wore European style clothing and had houses with walls. And there were even more villages like this uh, that had reports of these men in European clothing too. And so they drew a map for John Smith with these locations. So basically saying like there's clusters of... These people that are not dressed to traditional native right. clothing. It's very much European. There was also these houses that were supposedly seen that were like two-story with thatched roofs, like things that that weren't in native building plans at all. Right. And so they're like, oh my gosh, this is totally evidence that the colonists dispersed and integrated with other people. Right. So John Smith's men later investigate the areas that were drawn out for them, but they have nothing to show for it. Still no colonists. Yeah. And soon they have to Wasn't stop there their also shirts. Like, I thought Pocahontas' father also it, – it's it's interesting because I feel like there's so many – this story became such like mm-hmm. – uh, like now, like, you know, obviously news travels very differently, but like it became so public and everyone was trying to figure this out that like people were spreading rumors and telling different stories and like there were certain tribes that were taking credit for like murdering everyone. He did, he did tell John or apparently he told John Smith that he murdered them. Yeah, said, but there's a, they were all like, here, but not, not anymore. I, I killed them. them all. I killed yeah. them all. But they they still went. Yeah, they still went looking yeah. for them. Yeah. Um, and John John Smith's men are uh, they have to stop because uh, they were hit with a drought and they suffered from starvation and they turned to cannibalism to survive. So that is there's Sick. a lot of evidence that that Sick. that group uh, in jackets. Jamestown, Virginia, turned to cannibalism. So over the years, more people have gathered funding and permission to go and look for the colonists with the permission of, like, the queen and British royalty. Uh, But upon their return, they had nothing to show for it and also no proof that they'd actually gone and looked at all. So a lot of people were using this mystery and the colonists' disappearance as an excuse to go pirating. Of course. So not that many people looked for them. So sometime later, William Strachey arrives in Jamestown and he starts to gather information on Virginia and the various colonies and the native populations in the area. And this is where he hears that there were colonists, that they were never named the lost colony of Roanoke, but there were definitely some missing colonists here, which is like, how many missing colonists are there? This has to be the Roanoke right. people. Um But he hears that they lived peacefully for 20 years with a tribe just beyond the Powhatan territory. Uh, Mm. But then the Powhatan people killed them in cold blood. Interesting. One thing to consider. I mean, maybe this is true. We don't know what happened. We don't know. We don't know any answers here. We don't know any answers. Uh, But at this point, this is not a group of this colony is not a group of soldiers. This is a group of right. men, women, and now quite a few children. Yeah. Uh, so I can't imagine that there'd be something where 200 people would need to be slaughtered, especially because there was no way if this colony hadn't stuck together, they would have had to split into smaller groups because there was no way that a group of 100 plus people could join with a lot of the like known tribes in the area and mm-hmm. and sustain because they were just really really big and they also There's carried so many a of ton them. of diseases with them yeah you know so yeah. another thing to consider um in terms of this guy william strackey's account is that this is probably not true what he said uh mm-hmm. because he said that they killed him in cold blood because there was some poet and priests that got a message saying that they needed to kill them and blah, blah, blah. So he had actually thought at, at the time um, that the poet and religion was satanic and that they communed mm. with the devil. So he was basically just trying to create a witch hunt is right. what happened. Right. It's Yeah, it's like the differences of religion. It is interesting to me, though, because 
I mean, obviously survival outweighed like everything in that time and Mm -hmm. it still does. But like if you are the colony of Roanoke and you decide to move because the resources are limited and maybe someone, you know, went on a little expedition and was like, oh, I found this place hundreds of miles away, but like we can get there by, by foot in a couple months and it, there's way more resources, there's like fresh water, whatever it may be, don't you think that someone would be like, well, we should send someone back here every so often to check for John and the other people who said that they were going to come back? Yeah. That makes sense, right? It's not that far away. And yeah. wouldn't you – I mean, it seems like all of the native groups in the area, like they had – communicate their chiefs and their, their leaders had – communication with one another and and knew what yeah. was going on in the area so you would think that there would be some sort of version of that too where like through the grapevine at least they would hear some communication that more yeah. people had come and yeah. yeah 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 so it's very it's very very strange um it's also quite possible that the colonists never wanted to be found because history mm. and and uh evidence shows that in colonial era the people who spent a lot of time with the native americans or were maybe kidnapped by the Native Americans, adopted their culture and lifestyle, and they really enjoyed life, and they didn't want to return. Interesting. And if you're thinking it sounds like that's, you running into the woods. I know. <laughs> and at first I was like, Stockholm Syndrome? But then I was like, no, because the evidence also shows that on the flip side, any Native people who were taken by the Europeans and spent a lot of time with them and were made to sort of like adopt their some of their lifestyle uh, didn't feel the same way at all and really wanted to return home. So, yeah. yeah, it's possible that. But it's just the, weird for like 115 plus people to all right. have that same opinion. Right. And, and growing, you know, it's just. And not be seen, you know, not that's be a lot of people. Upon. Yeah, it is. Uh, possible sightings of the lost colony of Roanoke continued to surface. Some described pale skinned people with blonde hair living amongst the tribes. There was a boy with gray eyes and blonde hair that was written about in one of the explorer's journals. Uh, But Mm. researchers today do believe that this is maybe not an actual person from the lost colony, but maybe a a sighting of someone with albinism because it was much more frequent to have someone born uh, with albinism Mm. in Native American groups. Other accounts tell of native tribes who have the two-story cottages, the fetched roofs, uh, and some of the people in these tribes would know English. They could read and write in English. They had English surnames. But also, I will say, like, there's been a lot – there's been many years of colonization at this point. So it's possible that they just learned that without without being – without reproducing and marrying colonists and continuing the bloodline um but there's also another clue that backs up the claim that the people dispersed and integrated uh with the people and that is another inscription on a tree so remember at roanoke island there was crow and then there was croatoan now on croatoan island there was a tree that said cora c-o-r-a on the mainland was a very small native tribe called the Cori, also known as the Coronine or Coronin. Uh, hmm. So people are thinking maybe this could be another clue saying that they had moved from Croatoan Island to live with the Cori people. But unfortunately, lightning struck this tree and there was a lot of decay. And so we can't actually measure accurately when this inscription on the tree was carved. So we don't know. Interesting. So much mystery. So much mystery. The Lumbee tribe. Did you hear about the Lumbee tribe when you were listening to different I don't think. Uh, I don't know. Okay. So the Lumbee tribe, depending on who you ask, claims to be the descendants of both native people and Roanoke colonists. Oh. So there could be some truth to the theory. And then, of course, like the DNA research is, is being done to see if, if they can even do right. any trace evidence. But apparently with the Lumbee tribe... Half of them are saying that, yes, they're descendants of the Roanoke colonists, the lost colony of Roanoke. Um, but then other people are saying that's not necessarily yeah. our, an exact truth um, and not our our roots. Hmm. Okay. So now for centuries 
everyone has discussed Roanoke as this mysterious event where the only clue left behind was the word Croatoan inscribed on a tree. But there were a few more clues, almost like a treasure hunt, that made lead us back to the colony. From 1937 to 1941, 43 stones were found from North Carolina to Atlanta, and they were thought to be clues. The first was discovered by a California man who was driving through North Carolina, and he was exploring alongside the road. He pulled over and was looking around, and he came across a 21-pound rock engraved with some strange markings and a linguistically older version of English, which we now know was, uh, what was it? It was like Elizabethan English. Hmm. It spoke of war and hardship over a two-year span, and the author, addressing their father, wrote that half of them were dead, including their father's son-in-law and granddaughter. This inscription was signed with the same initials as John White's daughter, Eleanor Dare. And so the man who discovered this rock, he had no idea what it was. He just thought it was pretty cool and was probably important. So he brings it to a college. He sells it to a professor. And this professor makes the error of publicizing it, offering a reward for any more stones that turn up and are found like this. So soon, 42 more stones (laughs) uh, make their way into his possession over a three or four year span. Collectively, these 43 stones are referred to as the Dare Stones. But the 42 additional stones that were uh, given to him after the original end up being traced back to a single stone cutter. They were forgeries. They were a hoax. They were fake. Yeah. Just some and guy the original, trying to make some money. Right? Yeah. I mean, it, it's – you have to be pretty confident in your in yourself <laughs> to do that. And also, that. like, 42 is kind of over the top, sir. Like, I don't know, maybe, like, two or three more? Right. At max? 42 is a lot. And it's like, yeah. how did he know enough information about Roanoke at the time? Mm-mm. And also yeah. – He wasn't, he didn't, part of the reason why it was an easy, easy forgery discovery was because the way that he was writing, like linguistically. Yeah, it wasn't the right language. It was off. Like he was using words that didn't exist in the vocabulary (laughs) at the time. It's like, Like, if you're going to do this, either use fewer words or like do a lot of research. It's like most likely to be a Tinder swindler. In my yearbook <laughs> is his is his the Tinder category. Story. He tried, he tried, but he failed. Uh, <laughs> failed big time. But the original stone still hasn't been disputed as fake. It might mm-hmm. it might be something. So it's still being researched, but based on the top layers of weathered rock in comparison to deeper rock in it, uh, it's thought to have been etched a few hundred years ago. So this is a promising lead, but again, no real conclusion. Then weren't there like patches on it or something like that? Like they had like covered up something and one of them didn't reveal anything and then another one did. That's that's a part two. Okay. Oh, so sorry. You gotta wait. It's okay. You gotta wait. Excited. Okay. In 2012, a real break in the case happens. In a very Indiana Jones meets National Treasure fashion, researchers at the First Colony Foundation were examining a map at the British Museum in London, and this map was one that John White had painted, titled La Virginia Pars. And under the right lighting, when they had the map backlit, invisible ink became noticeable. A secret message appeared, and X marked the spot. To be continued next week. Shut up. (laughs) (laughs) Isn't it so good? I was like, X marks the spot? What? So good. Corbin, what a cliffhanger. Oh my gosh. I know. Okay, I will be mad though if, I mean, spoiler alert. Oh, it's they're still, never it's found. still a mystery. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, still, a mystery. it's still a mystery. But I would be bummed if John White, this guy who like left for three years, came back and is the reason we know that there is a missing colony of Roanoke had some information and never told anyone about it. You know, like that would be disappointing to me. It is a theory that we will discuss in part two. (laughs) (laughs) It's so hard. I literally, Ah. I, I, 
started writing part two and I'm like halfway through it, but I, I have almost everything done for like finishing yeah. up this part of part two. And there was part of me where, where I was like, should I just say it? Should I just include it in this episode? And I was like, no, 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 leave Save it. For it's suspenseful. Two. Yeah. Part two. We'll Corinne, find out that's what a happened great on the way to tell treasure a story. map. You like that Ooh. cliffhanger? That was good. I love it. And I, message appears. We were we've been talking about invisible ink a lot lately. I feel like I know. I, shouldn't, I think that's gonna be my like my mo now is any because I because obviously my journals are gonna be very important in a hundred years. Um, <laughs> in everything that I do, I'm gonna start writing things in invisible ink just for like hopefully one day someone's curious. Maybe my, maybe it's my children. Who knows? Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna leave important messages in invisible ink, and I can't wait for it. I think that's a good idea. I think you and I should should get the same invisible ink kit and then we can just send each other yes. messages. messages. I love it. Get I'm going to send you like, right it's going to look like blank pieces of paper in the mail and it's probably just going to say like, hi, period. Hi. And that's it. It's like when I sent you a message that you had to convert in Webding's font. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Wait, I'm so into this. Let's do it. We love this type of story we right love like this we like heat it up underneath hunt. to like see yes yeah so good yes okay i'm I very curious remember. what you picked out for a listener email to so this coincide was difficult roanoke s i know and then of course we made it a two-parter well okay so i basically my go-to for this was to pick something outdoorsy and woodsy because roanoke is just that <laughs> Yep. And um, I basically was like trying to channel because American Horror Story did a Roanoke season. And so I was just mm -hmm. like trying to like, obviously, that's not fact or based on much truth because it's fictional. But I was trying to like channel that when I was searching for stories. Ooh, so I love it. Didn't Roanoke, didn't they make, did they make John White's? I'm trying to think of who Kathy Bates played. Was she supposed to be John White's? wife who never oh, came. I don't remember I don't know I don't, I don't remember. remember oh it was such a good season of American Horror Story though but yes it not was. not very factual at all not at all okay but so I picked a story from our listener Rebecca or sorry from our listener Becca and it's called scariest moment in my life uh -oh. hey ladies Hi. I just recently started listening to your podcast and I'm completely in love my coworker who introduced me to your show, hello coworker and pyramid schemer, and <laughs> welcome. That's a bump up on the that pyramid. is the triangle. Welcome to yeah. the triangle. Thank you for participating. Why do I feel oh wow, so, yours is so much bigger oh. than mine. We're, we're this is for YouTubers, the YouTube yeah. watchers. <laughs> um, my coworker and I throw our earbuds in and hit play at the same time so we can listen together in the loud ass <laughs> restaurant kitchen we work in. Oh my gosh, that's so fun. That is. We love your energy, love your content. I have a super crazy story that happened back when I was in high school that I still can't explain. Mm -hmm. I'd think I was crazy, except my buddies who I went camping with that night experienced it as well. My family owned a secluded private lake spot that me and my friends basically lived at every summer. So cool. This is also the beginning of like a horror movie already. I know. That's exactly what I was thinking. You were like, so cool. And I was like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Sounds it was a little a, bit scary. A little, little spooky. It was a long dirt road that traveled through a field and the grass on both sides of this road was taller than any of our cars. When you hit the lake access, it was a small parcel boxed by four weeping willows. Oh, beautiful. And it was fenced in with rusted barbed wire that was meant to keep the cows out of the nice grass years prior. <laughs> four of my friends and myself decided to go camping up there. And when the sun went down, we pitched our tents and I backed my pickup up to the fire so I could sleep in the bed of it with my best boy in the world, my dog, Buddy. My friend Celia's tent was pitched right next to my truck while our three guy friends went night fishing on the dock not far from where we were sleeping. Celia, Celia tuckered down in the tent while I curled up in the bed of my truck with my fur baby. And all of a sudden, Buddy starts panting and pacing the full length of the pickup. He even hops up, balancing on the edge of the bed, whining and drooling. This was extremely odd behavior for him, and it gave me a not-so-great feeling in my gut. 
trust yeah. your pets. I tried calming him, but he still had this horrible feeling, but I still had this horrible feeling I couldn't shake. So I sat up and started looking around. Everything being cast in that small campfire glow, and I noticed something white crouching at the base of a tree to my left. Thinking it's my friend Celia just squatting to pee away from the tent because she went to bed in a white sweatshirt, I called her name. Celia? No answer. No movement. Uh. Thinking she didn't hear me and my heart completely pumping out of my chest, I call again, but louder. Celia? No, 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 Celia then answers from inside her tent next to my pickup. And the exact same time, this white object stands up in a human-like way and steps calmly behind the tree. Oh, I freak out, ew, but only I my that. voice. I know. Because then it's it makes it less animalistic, you know? Like, it, the fact that it's consciously knowing what to do and what it should be. Like, it's not just a deer being like, ah, and leaping away. Right. And it's the like fact that it waited. and make myself less known. And the fact that it waited until Celia responded because... It was like getting away with looking like Celia for a second. Right. And then it was like, oh, now she knows I'm not Celia. I'm going to. This is some uh, flush pedestrian behavior. Yeah. My body is completely frozen. I yell for my guy friends out on the dock and they all come running. Once they hit the pickup, the thing darts from behind the tree and jumps through the fence. What? My friends all see this. So they believe me when I say that there was something there. Of course, being 17-year-old country boys, they wanted to show off their fearlessness, so they dart off into the road, shining flashlights into the grass in the same direction that this thing went in. My buddy Alex, showing his small 22 pistol, is yelling out for whoever is in the grass to come out. And then the grass fucking parts. Like if you were to move it in a circular motion with two hands out in front of you, only to show two red eyes staring back at us no this is giving me this is giving the cornfield in signs right yes Ugh. or like children of the corn right we see nothing else except for these two red eyes i let out a small squeal and the boys literally gasp as the red eyes stare at us as they slowly crouch closer to the ground and then full and then slowly fucking disappear. We all literally run to the truck, leaving everything there and peel out towards home and could not sleep the rest of the night. I can't even capture the true feelings I had that night, but damn, I actually talked to an older man who had a similar experience with those same red eyed monsters around the same area. And it was so nuts. I 100% believe in the supernatural and I have stories of kettle steaming without my burners on or hearing footsteps through my halls. All of these circumstances happened in my younger days, but every now and then I something happens and I convince myself it's just a normal random occurrence. Thank you for reading my story. I hope you enjoyed it. It's something I'll never forget. You guys are absolutely wonderful and be safe out there in this crazy world. Becca. I don't want that experience. Sometimes. No, I don't. Sometimes part of me is like, oh, wouldn't that be cool if I were there? Wouldn't that be cool if I had seen that? This is horrifying. What is it? I don't know. And I'm curious what this older man said about his experience with these red-eyed monsters in the same area. And what is this area? Can we look it up? Like, it's just so – because it's interesting. Like, we've heard about cryptids, and I feel like oftentimes they're seen accidentally. But these – whatever this is, is very intentionally staring and watching and mocking. Like, the fact that it, like, parted – the mm-hmm. g- tall grass and then yes. stared yes. at all of them with its red, creepy ass eyes. It's so like I'm trying to think of what it could be. And I feel like it doesn't really match perfectly with anything that uh, at least that I'm the way I'm picturing it, it doesn't match with no. anything in particular that we've discussed. But it's oh. also kind of feeling alien esque in a way. Like it's almost making me wonder was this a weird spaceship that crashed and then this is the result of the alien creatures that are I left don't know. here. But then also it's it's a little it's a little animal esque too. Oh yeah. But it but the fact that it stood up in a human like 
I feel like Becca very clearly saw a human shape. At first it was squatting and then it stood up. Right. And was very humanoid. It reminds me of what were those creatures? The rake. The the rake. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it does, right? Because that that one picture that's of like the rake crouched over going Whoa! Yeah. in the woods. Whoa! It's not like from the deer camp. Whoa! It that's yeah, totally what I'm picturing. Yeah. Yeah. It's weird. I'm just gross. Oh, gosh. But yeah, I also super am intrigued. Unsettling. And the mm-hmm. fact that it didn't just like run away, like the fact that all these boys now are running after it and it mockingly was like, I know you were looking for me, but I'm not scared. And I'm then there's more you. of them. Yeah, Becca, we need like- to know what this man said. And wait, where is this? Did Do we, we know? Don't know? So Becca, you need to tell us where this is. Where to avoid. And <laughs> have you been back since? Because I don't think I would ever be able to go back after that. I know. And then do any of our listeners, like, does anyone else know what this is or have any similar experiences to this creature? Or is this one of you? Are you this creature? Please. Is this what a werewolf actually is? It's like someone, (gasps) someone's actually a werewolf, but unfortunately they have mange in their werewolf form. And so Mm. they're just kind of like a naked mole rat. Like a little embarrassed. You're like, oopsie. (laughs) I feel a little bit naked. I can't show myself. Yeah. Don't judge me. It's the back and forth. Like you want to attack, but then you're also like, I'm also really self-conscious. So you just Werewolves are self-conscious too. Just peek. Or what if they just want to be friends? What if this thing is so big that we think it's like this grown beast, but really it's just a little (laughs) wee baby who wants to hang out and have friends and socialize. I'm just a baby. I'm just a baby. Yeah. But then don't be so creepy about it, you know? It doesn't know, but then also, yeah, it's real. I, I don't know why I'm starting to be like, it just wants to be friends. No, I agree. I mean, that's what it wants you to think, Corinne. Right. And let's have some survival instincts here. Let's not try to yeah. befriend this weird, strange, it just, foreign creature from us that is intimidating us in the field. Yeah. And also to draw this back to Roanoke, like it's so. Interesting. Like, I don't think anyone is trying to argue that, like, oh, the Rona colony or colonists were abducted by aliens or taken by cryptids because I don't think that's ever really necessarily been a argument. But it does make me wonder, like, you're out in the middle of the wilderness. You maybe are running out of resources. There Mm -hmm. are diseases maybe you've never dealt with. There's hysteria. There's you know, there's just so many psychological things on top of yep. physical things that could have happened. And I do imagine like, I mean, how uncharted t- that territory was. Yes, there are tribes and natives living there, but are there cryptids and other creatures and monsters? And there's just a lot of right. things that they could have experienced and seen in the wilderness that made have, might have been like, you need to, we need to flee. And that's another reason why they probably should have befriended and been kind the whole time to the native groups that were living nearby as well because I feel like we that's the best source of truth and even though sometimes we consider it lore today or people say oh that's just lore like I think a lot of those things are very much fact and there's a lot yes that people who've been here for way more centuries and thousands of years than than we have have seen and have passed down the knowledge of and understand yeah. how to exist or not exist around these things. Right. And it's something that as a foreigner, you don't know what you're getting into. No, you don't know what's best. I actually just watched the movie, The Northman. I've never heard have of Have you that. seen the trailer for it? No. It's um, one of the Scars guards, Nicole Kidman, um, Ooh. And the girl from Nicole The Witch. Kidman it's the same. It. I think it's the same person who did The Witch. Oh, okay. That will be good. Yeah. I mean, anyway, when you saw it, what did you think? Um, it's very fascinating. So it's like kind of Viking type of lifestyle, but mm-hmm. it's a horror about like a, the son of like who was like a rightful heir of his like tribe of people l- flees as a young child and comes back to try to take what's rightfully his. And there's just a lot of like mysticism and spirituality involved yeah. in it. Like – I just think there's so many 
early day cultures that were so inherently in tune with the universe and spirits and mysticism Mm -hmm. that it's fascinating to see those stories represented and told. But yeah, again, like there's some truth in it and they really understood the ways of the world and still do in ways that I think our modern brains are like, no, we know best. It does make me wonder though in like 300, 400 years, what we believe to be so such an absolute truth today yeah. that people are, are going to be like, can you believe that this whole group of people thought this isn't the, there's that was crazy time to be alive. Yeah. And we just don't know. I'm going to be it. a ghost. I'm going to be a ghost and I'm going to come and I'm going to be a, I'm going to be very vocal and like haunt the shit out of everyone and prove that ghosts exist. And everyone's going to be like, I can't believe people 300 years ago didn't believe in ghosts. And then you're going to poke them and you're going to put on your sheet and you're just going to wander through and be like, you want to know how? Tune into Two Girls, One Ghost. It's a 400-year-old <laughs> podcast, but it will give you all the answers. Find my journals with invisible ink and you'll learn more. <laughs> <laughs> a SIM card just gets like placed and they're like, what ancient technology what is, is this? What is this? What is this? <laughs> USBs. USBs. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. We've seen floppy we've disc. seen a lot. We were we were the floppy disk. The we were VHS. We've seen a lot VHS. Yeah, cassette cassettes. Mm-hmm. Oh, all of our parents' cars had the cassette tapes in them still. Yeah, yeah. We've wow. seen some things. Um, and if you've seen some things, <laughs> so have you. So. Yeah, and if you have, email them to us at two girls one ghost podcast at gmail We are taking stories about literally anything and everything. It can be ghostly it could be cryptid it could be aliens it could be spooky it could be happy it could be sad it could be literally not about the paranormal but like a crazy wild story that wild, happened to just you really creepy just yeah. anything if mm-hmm. you just like had something you wanted to like get off your chest and you haven't told anyone email dear us. diary dear, dear diary dear sven yeah sven will not respond uh well no. he might show up in your home and haunt you um yeah we, hey. i mean he might respond we just don't know in what way yeah, that's a risk you're willing to take if you're listening to Two Girls, One Ghost. It is, because we are the most haunted podcast in America. And I feel yeah. like we uh, continue to earn that title. So yes, <laughs> it wasn't a one-time thing. It's continuous. No. Continuous. So you tell your friends. You can support us in multiple ways by yep, yeah. Pyramid Scheming. Tell two people. Have those people tell two people about our yeah. podcast. It's, the, it's spooky season, as you learned Spice lattes, pumpkin spice lattes are out officially, meaning um, everyone is looking for something spooky to listen to. So send them. Now's our time to shine. It's our season. We have YouTube if you want to visually watch us. Uh, And if you want to do those red eyes peering through the cornfield, watch us on YouTube. Uh, And stick around because October is coming as well. Got some spooky Mm -hmm. things planned. Maybe a special in there somewhere uh and we do have part two of roanoke coming next week yes and um we have an encounters on thursday and then part two will come out on sunday and we'll see you there we hope to see you on this side but if we do not we will see you you on on the the other other side side. oh wait and thank you to our editors at up digital aiden man and eric foster Max Lodian, all of them, everyone, we love you. Thank you for editing. Thank you. Okay, Okay, goodbye. Now, goodbye.